Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Mitch. Good Monday evening to you all. Hope you guys have had a great Monday and a great start to your work week. I know I just got done playing a game of horse with all the kids in the neighborhood. And of course, even though, you know, they're just kids, I had, I had to beat them. It just had to be done. So um, certainly a little wore out, a little sweaty right now, but it was certainly enjoyable. I always like going out there and uh, being kind of the, uh, the cul-de-sac dad, if you will, and having fun with the kids, things like that. But Anyways, hope you guys are having a great night out there. Got you an update on what's going on with the severe weather towards the end of this coming work week. Unfortunately, things have slowly uptrended, which means that, <clears throat> well, I just think that, you know, this might be a little, potentially a little worse than maybe what we thought it could be. Um, but of course, we never really truly knew what it was going to be. But uh, certainly, I would say, just based off the, the placement of low pressure, the dynamics that are at play, your kinematics, your thermodynamics, I'm definitely thinking that this could be, it's hard to use the term outbreak yet, but this could be a big time severe weather threat for areas of the south central U.S., in the deep south so that's what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about what we do know we're going to talk a little bit of snow right at the end of the video and we're going to try to figure this out uh, as we get you know day by day a little bit closer to this event i would not be surprised if we wake up tomorrow with a 30 percent risk up for uh day four for friday friday i think both days could be bad but i'm really eyeballing friday um, and then the severe weather threat could make it all the way into friday night into saturday potentially for the southeast but we it, it's still a little foggy. We're still trying to figure it out. So with that being said, if you folks have not subscribed, certainly consider doing that. Like the video if you like it. And if you guys got anything that I can pray about or pray over, as always, please put it in the comments below so I can pray over it and so others can do so too. So let's get rolling. We're going to be using Pivotal Weather a lot. And sometimes when I click on these little tabs, it takes a little time for these things to pull up. But we're going to give you some pretty cut and dry information here. Uh, what we do know is, is, you know, there is a slight risk, which is the 15% risk of severe weather for our, what is this, um, day four. This includes Oklahoma City, includes the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and extends all the way into the hill country uh, just west and uh, northwest of um, San Antonio. And then this goes all the way into central and south central Oklahoma, <clears throat> which, like I said, does include Oklahoma City. So, well, what we watch here for is as a, a low pressure is ejecting to the north, anything south of that has some players on the field for severe weather. So what's going to, where's going to be the best overlapping of dynamics? And, and, you know, I always talk about that, the thermodynamics, the kinematics, thermodynamics, meaning who has the best low level moisture, basically the highest humidity, the highest dew points. Who and, and, and basically whoever has that has the higher cape levels, which is that storm fuel that we talk about it. And then who has the best kinematics, which basically is the <clears throat> favorable wind pattern aloft, the spin to the atmosphere. How, you know, you got your directional shear, you got your speed shear, how fast are the, are the winds spinning as you go higher up in the atmosphere? How much does the winds change direction the higher up you go? That's your kinematics. So you got all these players on the field, but you got other players too, like cap which is basically an area of warm air aloft aloft meaning above our heads that prevents updrafts from really fully tapping in to all those dynamics above that area of stable air so you've got unstable air below that area which allows for those updrafts to go 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 and then they stop and they can't really explode which prevents a thunderstorm from really maturing and then you got an area favorable ingredients above that stable air in a cap and you know of course if it can't get above that uh, warm air advection that warm air aloft then of course then it, it can't tap into all that basically fuel that you got so went a little bit down a wormhole there but you guys get what i'm saying there's there's a lot of other factors too by just you know saying dew points cape uh your 850s your your 500 millibar streams so but that is the best thing to talk about at this range so that being said, you got that 15% risk. This is for Thursday, day four. You also, for day five, have a 15% risk, which extends uh, basically from a very small section of eastern and southeastern Texas all the way up to about Nashville, Tennessee. This does include Memphis, Jackson, Mississippi. Includes doesn't quite include uh, Shreveport, but Shreveport could certainly get an overnight threat Thursday night into Friday morning. This includes all the way down here, the Baton Rouge area. And uh, it does not really extend into Birmingham anymore, but this could change tomorrow. So if you're watching this tomorrow morning for your Tuesday morning, <clears throat> this could be totally different by then. So 
Let's talk about the ingredients in place. Well, actually, let's talk about what the GFS thinks the storm mode may be. And I can tell you, GFS and European, uh, those are global models. They're not mesoscale models. They're not what we call CAMs, short range models. They're not going to really show you the true evolution of what the storm mode can be. So all we can do is look at pivotal weather and look at the GFS. And we'll start this Thursday morning. We're getting into Thursday about midday. Here goes the low pressure popping off right here. You already have a ton of low level moisture building. Some moisture begins to fire off here. And then notice, you know, we're, at this point, we're in the Thursday evening. Not a whole lot, a lot of convection firing off down here. But if anything can break loose through the cap, basically, you know, a, a prohibitor of any kind of storm development, it could be supercell in nature. That's why you have the slight risk, which extends all the way down here into the hill country of Texas. But we watch. Do we have any kind of storm development that really fires up down here? At this point, we're at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, Friday morning, and you see moisture, but you don't really see, you know, the yellows and oranges. But don't focus too much on that. What we do know is the ingredients will be here for severe weather, but will anything really get going? As we get going into, you know, at this point, we're in the wee hours of the morning, Friday morning. This is when a secondary low pressure really fires off here. And then this is probably going to try to move across Arkansas and really get going, or maybe even southern Missouri. And then this is when some severe weather can be ongoing Friday morning. Okay? This is when we're getting into that day five range. So if you look at the GFS, it doesn't show much. I mean, we can flip back the GFS, the European, you know, all day if we want. But at the end of the day, we really aren't going to really truly know the storm mode until we get closer. But I can tell you the European, uh, certainly more explosive with the thunderstorm development into Oklahoma for Thursday afternoon. And even fires up some, I know this just looks like a big blob of dark green and yellow, but to me, this would probably be some supercell development as we're getting into a late Thursday evening. So the European is much more excited about Thursday as far as storm development than the GFS is. So it really develops almost a uh, kind of a linear type threat. Um, and then it has a developing line of storms that begins to really develop into the wee hours of the morning Friday. All this could be severe weather. It could be a line, a broken up line of storms, maybe embedded tornadoes, damaging winds, potential for hail. And we're waking up Friday morning with a line of storms moving through eastern Texas, working its way through Shreveport, and then this really gets going as we get into Friday and knocking on the doorstep of Mississippi where you got big time ingredients building into the region for your Friday for Mississippi. Okay, so a, a definitely different than the GFS. The models do not agree, especially with storm development, but the ingredients are there. And we'll, we'll just continue to take a look. And this is the lag I'm talking about. Just bear with me. It might take a minute for each panel to pull up, but the ingredients are there. For example, the GFS, moisture is already built all the way up into southern Oklahoma as early as Wednesday morning. Okay, dew points well into the 60s. This is plenty supportive enough for severe weather. Okay, we're getting into Wednesday evening. You already have a massive moist sector building all the way up into Missouri. Okay, the stage is set as far as moisture. We're getting into Thursday morning. Dew points well into the 60s all the way up here into Missouri and eastern Kansas. And some deep, rich moisture down here in southeast Texas. Okay, we're getting, at this point, the atmosphere begins to move a little bit. And this tells us that there's probably a low pressure with a trailing cold front. And as we're getting into midday, Thursday, early afternoon, a lot of low-level moisture into the area. A lot of humidity is basically what I'm saying. And basically, there's juice to the atmosphere just ready to get going with a massive, slow, collapsing moist sector with some kind of line of storms. And normally when you have... Normally, when you have a two dot, basically two air masses right beside each other, a very dry air mass and a very moist air mass, you normally have some dry air under or overcutting the atmosphere aloft, which means you're going to have some health threat, especially if any supercells get going in the hill country down here. You're probably going to have some dry air nearby. And sure enough, dew point 61 at the surface, but look how dry it gets. Look how dry it gets. But look, this is, this is the cap that I'm talking about. Notice that the surface is 74 degrees down here in the hill country, and then it drops, and then it rises. That is that warm air aloft. That is the cap that might prevent any storms from really getting going down here, even though you'll have a lot of atmospheric players at bay. A cap might prevent storm development down here in the hill country. But up here, not as much. You're closer to the low pressure. 
You got a lot more forcing. And uh, yeah, just, just a big time moist sector. And uh, we got to get this rolling again. And uh, the moist sector continues. You're getting in the Friday morning. Just a lot of a lot of moist air into areas Friday morning. Continuing to just be sitting here ready to be tapped into for Friday morning. Next thing you'll look at here is the low-level jet. Now, how is this placed with the low-level moisture? What we do know is we're getting the Thursday morning. Okay. You got a low-level jet pushing 30, 40 knots. Maybe a little higher. Maybe a little bit lower. You got dew points in well into the 60s in this area, but if you click a sounding, maybe you know just outside of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we take a look at what it looks like. Marginal severe. Okay, so do you have any kind of forcing? Do you have any storm development? You would think, okay, we would we we should have a big time development of storms. Well, not necessarily. You need other things ongoing. How much warm air aloft is there? Well. On the GFS, it's different. You flip it to the European model on this, and we kind of go to the same kind of time frame. Y'all just be patient with me. This has got to play all the way through. We go to that same time frame Thursday evening. Not as stout as a low-level jet, but you click a sounding on this, and uh, it's a totally different sounding. A lot more forcing at play. You got a tornadic sounding. You got a looping hodograph and just a different signal here. Temperatures are higher. And uh, the European is certainly more worrisome for Texas than the GFS is. Okay, but how much do you get this low-level jet cranked up into this region, okay, with these storms of developing? And it really gets going. And I really think as this low-level jet really starts to maximize Thursday evening, this will have a chance to really turn into a linear threat potentially Damaging winds, embedded tornadoes, and you got a 50 to 60 knot low-level jet building into eastern Texas. Probably some kind of line of storms into this region. So we got to watch out for this. And this continues continues to, to strengthen with a low pressure kind of flying to the north. And uh, I really think you're probably going to have a nasty line of storms working its way through maybe eastern Texas to Arkansas, Louisiana, sometime Friday morning. And then the stage will be building into the deep south. Speaking of the Deep South, the GFS, how does it have this storm mode? Well, starting Friday morning, the GFS, this is kind of what it shows, quickly develops a line of storms with a pretty strong, potent, low pressure actually moving through areas of southern Arkansas. Anytime you have a placement of low pressure right here, this far south, you're going to have a moist sector that's kind of sh shrinked. It's kind of smaller. Because just, just due to the fact that low pressure is pretty far south, the European is further north. So it has a more broader, moist sector. But, you know, you, you back it up right here. you got a nasty squall line probably moving through. This is really linear driven. A lot of the 850s are maximized in this area. Low-level jet is really cranking. This will all be mixing to the surface, meaning it will be very strong winds with this line of storms moving through. Maybe Little Rock sometime Friday. The timing is different. The timing is different. This starts moving through Shreveport based off the GFS Friday afternoon. And then the GFS really starts to slam Mississippi late Friday afternoon into Friday evening. Do any kind of supercells get going into Alabama, Mississippi ahead of this line of storms? We're not sure. And I'm, and I'm sorry to cut you folks off in uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. We'll get detailed, more detail about everybody here in the coming days, I promise you. But this line extends all the way up here for you guys also but this line of storms continues and we'll see how much it remains intact as we move into a saturday morning we certainly need to watch we'll go on and flip back and actually look at the gfs on what this looks like let's go all the way to friday morning okay and uh you know it has the line of storms kind of in the same area maybe a little bit earlier we're getting into about 1 2 p.m friday a line of storms moving through but this looks a little bit more worrisome. Both the GFS and the European, I will tell you, are more honed in on Friday together as a team, kind of. There's big differences for Thursday for like Texas for the GFS and the European, but I can tell you the European and the GFS, GFS has have much more agreement that, hey, Friday is going to be a big day. We'll stop it here. This is around you know middle to late afternoon Friday for central time out here in the deep south. And I know this looks like just one big blob of yellow and orange, but keep in mind, there could be supercells out in front of this, okay? 
and we keep this going here. This could be a broken line of storms. It could be supercells firing out in front of this. We take a look at a sounding here in central uh, Tennessee out ahead. You know, just a marginal tornado sounding. So nothing too crazy, but we, we, we do know some dynamics will be building into this area. And I'm going to be very interested to see what the short range models do for this event. We keep going into Saturday morning. Same kind of deal, just a broken line of storms potentially. But listen, I keep saying line of storms, broken line of storms, supercells. We really don't know the true storm mode of this. We do know that this is going to have some parameters in place, some dynamics. Dew points, it's going to be moist, guys. We know that Friday morning dew points uh, rising into the 60s all the way into Georgia at this point, And the dews really start to rise. I mean, look at this deep, rich moisture down here in southern Louisiana. Dew points into the low 70s. So there's going to be some big overlapping of dynamics, kinematics, low-level moisture into this region. Moist sector, GFS, certainly more intact to the south, stronger, better thermodynamics in these southern regions. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so we know the low-level moisture there, the kinematics are there. And this is really when it, you know, starts to get something you need to worry about right here is, you know, you look at this, this is – you know, a 60, 70 knot low level jet and places flying over areas of Louisiana, Mississippi, getting into Friday afternoon and evening. To me, this screams damaging wind threat, but will this just be a linear kind of look, meaning just a line of storms? Will supercells get going out ahead of this? It's a big question. It's a big question here. In response, we know there's going to be, be a lot of Cape, a lot of storm fuel into Texas. For example, down here, uh, deep in the hill country of Texas, southern Texas, where temperatures will rise well into the 80s, uh, Kate will probably rise well above 1,500 to 2,000 joules per kilogram. So you're going to have a lot of juice to the atmosphere down here. Okay, but will storms fire? Remember, I talk about the warm air advection. You keep this going, how much Cape rises ahead of this atmosphere in the deep south? Will this be more of a kind of a high shear, low Cape kind of event? But I can tell you almost always when we get in these short range models, CAPE always trends higher. Okay, so we'll continue to watch out for this. We'll get much more detail when we can. But um, watch for this to uptrend because there's a lot of players on the field out there for this. Let's talk about some cold weather and some snow. Freeze warnings continue for the purple. It's going to be another cold night. Last really cold night, I think, though, for a lot of folks. Winter storm watches remain for northern Minnesota. Some of these have been upgraded to winter weather advisories, winter storm warnings for two counties in northeast Minnesota with some lake-enhanced snow. We'll take a look at what can happen. We'll start this off tomorrow morning, and then we're getting into, and I will tell you, there will be a little bit of free, frozen precipitation here in Nebraska. That's why you have winter weather advisories. Some freezing drizzle is certainly possible in certain areas. We're getting into, I would say, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. Some heavy snow might develop in South Dakota, areas of southern North Dakota. And then this becomes more congealed, more of a consolidated area of snow as we're getting into uh, Tuesday evening. So some moderate to heavy snow is falling in, in western, I'm sorry, eastern areas of North Dakota. All of the northern half of Minnesota, this is all rain in Minneapolis. And this is likely going to deliver some pretty heavy snow for a very short amount of time, you know, relatively speaking, just several hours. And then, um, you know, we'll deliver some snow overnight, Tuesday night until Wednesday morning for northern Wisconsin, and then to the UP of Michigan, waking up for your Wednesday morning. This will deliver several inches of snow in these areas. Uh, and here we go. You know, some areas could get over a half a foot of snow, maybe six to eight inches of snow in this area right here in northern Minnesota and uh, eastern South Dakota, southeast, uh, I'm sorry, southeast North Dakota. And then more snow for you folks up here in northeast Minnesota, hugging Lake Superior, where you could get another, heck, maybe six to ten inches of snow. Uh, there will be a little bit of a freezing rain, a little bit of glaze as possible down here in uh, areas of central and northern Nebraska where you can get a few one hundredths of an inch of ice. So be aware of a glaze in these areas. But uh, I can tell you one thing. There's a lot of rain coming. An active storm track in general shooting around this part of the country. Rounds of heavy rain. This is rainfall from between now and about the end of the month. Potential rainfall. Blend of all models really likes to hit... Uh, the Mississippi Valley, pretty good. Um, the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, Kentucky, with widespread two to as much as five inches of rain. So I think flooding is going to steadily become a storyline 
and these areas of the country right into here. So we'll watch out for that. That's all I got, guys. We'll continue to get more detailed as we get closer. Y'all have a great night. God bless all y'all, and I'll talk to you in the morning.